Greetings, and thank you for joining us for another SANS ICS Concept Overview. I'm Don C. Weber of Cutaway Security and a certified SANS instructor. In this concept overview, I'm joined by Daniel Baye, a cybersecurity lead architect at Schneider Electric and a member of the EC Council Global Advisory Board for Ethical Hacking. Daniel is here to speak to us today about the integration of cloud services into the control environment. He will introduce us to the concepts of edge computing and how vendors and integrators will be modifying their solutions in the near future. If you enjoy this video and the topics we cover in the SANS ICS concept overviews, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel. Leave a comment if you have a question about this topic or suggestions for future content. Today, I'm joined by Daniel Paye of Schneier Electric. Daniel is here to discuss Internet of Things integration via edge computing. He will introdu introduce us to this topic and help us understand how it applies to control environments. Uh, thanks for joining us, Daniel. Can you start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and then uh, um, get into the discussion? Yeah, thank you, Don. Real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Daniel. I've been with Schneider Electric a little over seven years. Uh, before that, I, I've worked in uh, contracting with the Department of Defense, Army, and the, and the Air Force. Um, I've done work in the commercial world or you know the civilian world uh, as a administrator of an Active Directory. I've done firewalls, intrusion detection systems. I've, I have a pretty heavy uh, IT background. So when I was hired by Schneider, I came into this thing called OT and all these weird things called Modbus and BACnet and all these odd, odd protocols. So it's it's always a, a learning experience. Uh, I really enjoy working uh, at Schneider where I work and uh, every day is something new. So I'm just glad to be able to share some stuff with Don in the audience and uh, you know, really glad to be here. Uh, excellent, Thank thanks thanks for joining us. You, you guys have a great team out there and you guys are being really vocal. So uh, I'm you know about some of the technologies and uh, improving the environment and educating people. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm really excited to listen to this. So uh, you know, please, let's get started. Sure, so what I like to discuss is the, what's called the Purdue model and its relevance to the IoT, the edge and the cloud. Um, there's uh, been a lot of what I call consternation concerning the Purdue model. Uh, some people say, oh, this is out of date. You know, it's for OT on premise and all this other stuff that's going on. And, uh, and I'm taking the argument, no, it's still very relevant. Um, and uh, that's kind of the discussion, right? So those of you who are familiar with the Purdue, it's, it's, it's a reference. It is not a, uh, an architecture of security. It's a functional reference, in my opinion, right? You have these different levels let's say on a, in a factory or any kind of a critical infrastructure where you have your IO devices, you have your control, supervisory operations, you have a, a DMZ, right? So vendors can come in and support. And then you also have your enterprises where the business resides. So this is something that's been around for, I think since the 1990s, it's, it's pretty well viewed at. It's referred to as the Purdue model. I've seen it as PERA, P-E-R-A. -E I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Um, Sure, will come to me after the. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, Purdue uh, Enterprise Reference Architecture. Thank you, Don. So, this is kind of what you, you look at, or I look at, right? So, when you start seeing things like this, right? So, here's an example of a Purdue, and you'll see they're putting firewalls between the functionality. And while, okay, I, I think that you, know, you should have your firewalls over, you know, especially around safety systems, or including a data diode would probably be the best thing to put in front of a safety system, or as my friends at Waterfall call it, a unidirectional gateway. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think what's happened is this conception that, uh, from what I've seen, my experience is conceptions like this is a security reference architecture, and it's not. We're talking about pure OT functionality, right? Because at the end, whether it's OT or IT, it's still ports and protocols. I, I had a senior master sergeant when I worked for the ANG Air Force and real smart guy, and I learned a lot from this guy. He was the head of the firewall team where I was attached. And he goes, you know, it's all about ports and protocols. If you know your ports and protocols, you can troubleshoot anything in two minutes. And I mm -hmm. found that to be true. I think that's very true. And I think in OT, that's even more important because we're dealing with safety, right? We've discussed right. already. It's all about safety. I can't sit there and reboot a firewall with change management or, you know, or PLC, especially with PLC. So I want to kind of discuss you know, what the Purdue model is what the per versus what it is not. It is not a security reference architecture. It's pure, oh. pure, pure functionality, right? 
Uh, absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, we teach in our class. And whenever I go out to my clients, you know, I, uh, whether I'm teaching them or I'm, uh, you know, uh, um, we're kind of coming to the agreement on terminologies and how they're using it within their environment, you know, and uh, it, it took me, uh, at least when I first started getting into this, it took me a while to realize that, um, that the Purdue model was uh, basically how organizations uh, um, would uh, um, outline how they're going to approach the, the development and the deployment uh, of their processes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, as, as soon as I, as soon as I saw it from my, you know, architecture background, uh, you know, as soon as I saw like the previous slide, um, I, I realized that, hey, we can use that with our, you know, to, uh, um, provide enforcement zones. And so we've mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the security industry has kind of forced ourselves on top of this model, um, you know, partially because it's what people understand, you know, and, right. and it's, you know, we, we have to speak in a language that they understand. There's a reason why we still use ladder logic uh, in some of, as our programming language in some of our PLCs. And that's because the engineers and the operators understand that, uh, you know, so, you know, using th things that they're used to uh, helps. Uh, but at the same time, as we start adding things to that, um, you know, the, the number of things that we're adding into these environments, I mean, th this is a great slide showing the uh, diversity of things that are going in here. Um, and that increases the complexity and it makes it really hard. It starts blurring the edges a lot. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of your, uh, right. as you go forward. So speaking of edge, <laughs> right, so. Okay. What is what is edge computing? And I stole this definition, right? It's a highly distributed computing environment bringing computation data you know, storage closer to data sources. So now we've got something else now here, right? So now we start looking at SCADA systems on the edge. We start looking at PLCs could be on the edge, right? To me, anything can be on the edge. Mm -hmm. if you're looking at, if you look at like a building management system, for example, like you have a, a multi-story building, you could have thousands of sensors. Right in this distributed environment, like you know, HVAC, light, uh, whatever functions a, a building needs. Now you've got all of these devices that are going to be talking to the cloud, and you know, and, and people are saying, "Well, you know, the Purdue model goes out the door." I said, "I disagree. You still have to have, you know, the proper network segmentation. If anything, what edge computing brings is a greater need for micro segmentation. Right? We're going to have to. You're going to have to segment even more." which means you have to look at security, maybe throw in more firewalls, throw in some data diodes to maybe some of the more critical things that are out there. So when I, you know, when, when I start seeing these discussions of, you know, you know Purdue models gone and you know, I, won't, I won't reference you know, who did those because you can find them yourselves. I, I kind of have to step back and think, you know, why are you saying this is, this is dead and we have to move on? You know, some are not, some are defending. I'm one of the defenders. And it, to me, it's like, again, it's still, whether it's edge or not, it's a port or protocol. Likewise on the Purdue, it's still gonna have a function. Mm -hmm. These edge devices are going to have a function. You have a SCADA system that's gonna be talking to uh, maybe some meters, right? The meters are, are you know, uh, looking at the energy, that's that the energy usage, what's going on. Or maybe in a building, fun, building management system, you have a PLC, what function is that PLC doing? So now it's become, you know, while the potential is even greater with edge computing, because now you can have, you know, more real time uh, uh, information to make you know, faster decisions, which can help the business with that greater dispersion, you know, this dispersion of data and, and devices. Now, you know, our, our work as architectures gets a little more architects becomes more complex, especially in the OT world, right? Because we still have to have the resilience. We still have to maintain the safety. And now you've got a bunch of devices now we're going to have to sit there and go, okay, how do we make sure someone doesn't get in here and lives in my environment? That gets interesting, right? Absolutely. So uh, yes. a little bit of clarification on this so that we know what we're looking at from the uh, um, diagram standpoint. Sure. Everything sure. on the bottom, uh, would you consider that to be kind of your uh, um, endpoint devices, your uh, uh, sure. zero yeah. and one? Uh, and mm -hmm. then I would imagine that the, uh, um, the block that says edge, where we have the mm -hmm. edge node, um, sure. those are going to be servers within, I would assume, uh, from this uh, within your uh, level three environment, so your management sure. servers, yeah. and those management servers are communicating with the cloud, um, yeah. and some of the computation is being done in the cloud. Are they just serving up data in this instance? Um, yeah. Are they doing uh, um, computations? Uh, you know, uh, can be. Yeah, this represents? Be. Sure, it, you can do analysis up on the cloud, right? And I, that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. 
not only can you do a, a analysis, but could there be some, you know, I was asked the question, why can't you have functions on the cloud? Question is, what are those functions going to be in your architecture, right? Obviously, you know, if I say command and control from the cloud, everyone's hair is going to turn right and we're all going to say, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. Uh, not today anyway, right? And, and, and uh, your point to ladder logic not changing, you know, because these PLCs are around for 20 years, right? Same way as people that are in OT, some of these process engineers have been around for decades and you say, I want to put something on the cloud. You're going to have a hard sell to convince them, in my opinion. And then there's the reality of, do I put a command and control of a circuit breaker on the cloud? Obviously, nuclear reactors are not going to be on the cloud, right? right. I mean, you know, I, I cringe when I hear these things. But to your point, yeah, the edge can be, you know, the super, it could be the operational, could even be the supervisory, right? It can be collecting that data from the lower level, processing it, sending it up to the cloud for analysis, or maybe it's just a straight through pass to the cloud for maybe a function of, some, maybe some sort of a, a function of some kind, right. or even could be a virtualized device in the cloud running, right? And that, yeah, and that's interesting. You know, when, right. when I think about this stuff, and you talk about some of the uh, um, challenges for people understanding it um, and the, um, uh, I'm losing words these days, but uh, um, you know, the, the fact that people don't want to, you know, uh, have push those things out to the cloud, they're not comfortable with that. Well, I, I, I personally, I think that's going to change very rapidly. Certainly some of our critical infrastructure, um, it's, it's going to be a long time before we start moving those things. Uh, the test bed is going to be some of our uh, sectors that don't have those, uh, that, that criticality, um, food and beverage distribution, uh, um, you know, and possibly even, uh, um, you know, uh, other development uh, areas. Um, are going to push some of those computations out there. The vendors are going to push that out there, the, the capabilities and so forth, uh, and companies need to be ready for that. So, you know, uh, um, understanding this and that relationship, understanding, realizing that some of this is going to be, uh, you know, pushed out there at some point, whether it's infrastructure as a service or uh, um, uh, 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 systems as a service and so forth, uh, it's, uh, they're going to have to take that into consideration going forward. Sure, sure. And, and you mentioned um, with the edge and that. So there's another concept called open fog, if you like fog computing. They actually have a framework, which I found interesting. And, and I did a presentation in 2016 about the future of the IoT, which there's no future, right? Because today, you know, yesterday's today or whatever mm -hmm. you can say about that. And, and one of the things I, I, I was pretty impressed with, with the fog concept was not only is there a framework, but a lot of the stuff's done on premise and selectively sending stuff to the cloud is how I understand it. But what I like about it is it keeps a lot of the intelligence on premise. So for, for the audience, you should look up Open Fog, Open Fog Consortium. Um, there's some books um, that discuss the difference between edge and open fog, and there is a difference between edge and fog. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to convolute too much here, but um, I think that's a concept that 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 should be looked at. And uh, I'll, I'll put link. I'll put links to to each one of these in the show notes. And we might have lost Daniel. Let's give him a second to come back. Okay, we just had a network network glitch, but we're uh, we were finishing up talking about edge computing, and I think we're pretty much done. I think we kind of you know covered the uh, edge cases of edge computing. So um, uh, you know, please continue, Daniel. All right. So now we'll talk about a little bit the difference between IoT and IIoT, right? The industrial Internet of Things versus the Internet of Things. And the industrial internet of things is kind of a subset, right? And, and some of the major differences, right? And this is where we're concerned as architects and security people in the OT world is, we still have to have high levels of security and reliability, right? We can't have unauthorized persons coming in there and, and hacking these processes because we deal with lives and safety. Cross compatibility, some of these uh, devices have to coexist, right? With, you know, different OSs and things like that. We have to have absolute precision. Mm -hmm. Right. There's no no screwing around, for lack of a better word. Right. Because we can't have something develop the uh, disrupt the process. Right. In the IT world. OK, I reboot in the process. Well, it's not so simple as we know. Right. And this is some of the challenges of the IoT. Uh, consistent connectivity. That makes me laugh since we had a little network glitch here. And it's <laughs> right. a little more consistent. And, and, you know, there's less tolerance for latency. And this is where the edge comes in, where you have. You know, these processes and services are much closer together. Uh, so you, you have your storage, your computer is much closer together. And now you have this uh, latency, you can overcome the latency, which is very beneficial, right? Automation, uh, 
we're all for automation, you know, less human interfacing and then serviceability, right? So it's because mm -hmm. consistent maintenance is key, right? If you have a, if you have a change, uh, uh, you put in a change management, which is very particular in OT, uh, you want to make sure that's that serviceability can be done quickly and efficiently. And of course your fallback plan, if you have to ever use one. And especially if you're having like a, a system integrator who's going to come in, uh, either could be remotely, depending on your, your, your appetite for risk or your stomach for risk. And all of these things play into the IIoT, which is why to me, it's, it's so important. And the Purdue does apply here, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. have your, your secure conduits, you have your security zones, you have your patch management, all of the things have to be done. And the Purdue, the functionality, whether it's IIoT or in, in the conventional premise, they still apply in my opinion. So from, from this example right here, and I know you're about to get into some of what, what you just talked about, but just for the clarification of the um, people that are listening, uh, uh, and just looking at your uh, image right there. So you have a con uh, consumer on the right, industrial on the, the left. Um, you know, uh, usually when I'm describing Internet of Things, you know, I, I, I typically talking about this consumer things, you know, your uh, um, smart TVs, thermostats in your house. Uh, and other things that are, you know, communicating back to some kind of uh, cloud infrastructure. An organization has put a bunch of those things out there. You know, cameras, you know, are a big example, you know, and something that's been hacked recently from a, you know, a corporate standpoint. Uh, but what we're, what you're more referring to is the things on the left, the industrial things. Um, uh, do you have any examples of those that would kind of help people understand the difference between our smart TVs or something like that? Well, I mean, a PLC would be a classic example, in my opinion, right? I mean, or let's look at a circuit breaker. Um, a circuit breaker is, you know, it deals with power. Uh, if you have a hacker that comes in, classic example would be the Ukraine, right? They took over a substation and started playing with circuit breakers. And, you know, people lose power. Well, that can affect a hospital. If a hospital right. doesn't have backup generators, somebody could die. Whereas your it's, smart TV, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so, so, you, so you're just talking about some of our normal, um, uh, uh, normal uh, endpoint devices and controllers that we have in our control networks, but they're being um, uh, they're providing information up to the cloud, or they're actually being controlled from the cloud. Is that kind of uh, what we're? Is that? Kind say, of the I would say providing information to the cloud, not so much control from the cloud, because I'm 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 still a little shy on that one. Um, right. For the circuit breaker, um, do I think it's going to come? Uh, I don't know. I'm not. My crystal ball is about as cracked as anyone else's. But I know that there's a lot of discussion about, you know, the, the sanity of bringing, you know, control, command and control from the cloud. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, that's why the FOG architecture and the, the FOG reference model, I think, is a real interesting uh, reference to look at as far as, you know, what do you send to the cloud? And again, it's going to depend on what your appetite is for risk, right? I well, mean, I mean, when, it, when I'm looking at this and, you know, from what you've been describing is that, uh, you know, and this all boils down to requirements for me. You know, if you're going to connect these things to the cloud because um, that's your uh, that that's the place that your organization wants to move, or you're being uh, um, uh, kind of pulled there, you know, not pushed but pulled there by um, some of your vendors or some of the solutions that are being put out there. Um, all of our requirements that we have within our uh, normal processes are all going to apply to this, and that's really going to sure. help. Uh, that that's going to guide organizations on what to whether they can do this or they can't do this. Correct, right, it's, it's gonna be whatever the policies are of the organization, right? So if I can go to the next slide. Uh, oh, on this one, is So when we look at the cloud, uh, this is a, a drawing uh, to give kudos to Mr. Uh, Gabriel Feifman. He's kind of the, the guru of the standard, 62443. And we came up with this, this, uh, this idea of the SP, which the SP comes from the 62443 standard, which is a security program. And these are the relevancy of, of how they fall into the responsibility. So this table is nothing new. There's a bunch of them out there. You know, I just kind of drew it to include the security, uh, security program from the standard. And you look at the responsibility. So whatever is green is gonna be what we call an asset owner from the standard, right? The person who actually owns the site, for example. The blue would be the cloud service provider. That could be, you know, Google, Amazon, Azure, you know, pick your, pick your vendor of choice. So when you're on premise, you can see that the security and the responsibilities are all in green, which is the asset on, all right? You're on premise, you know, Don, you've worked on premise, you know how that goes. Now, when you start going to the cloud and you see like the responsibilities start to scale, right? So when I do infrastructure as a service, 
Now the cloud service provider has the responsibility of the physical security of the data center and the host infrastructure and the network controls. However, you're responsible as the asset owner for the security of the VMs are running, whatever firewalls, whatever your infrastructure, you're responsible for that security, right? So uh, some people have this misconception, oh, if it's on the cloud, I'm secure. Uh, read your contract, right? Read your contract with your service ISP, uh, with uh, you know your, your cloud service provider. Now we move to platform as a service. You can see the responsibility shift even more where now as the asset owner, my data classification is mine and the client and endpoint protection and then, uh, then IAM, identity access management, it's kind of a share and the application control is kind of shared too. It's kind of a gray area and there's, there's you know, shared responsibilities. Now software as a service, now you can see that the cloud service provider has a lot more responsibility, you have less. That doesn't mean that you can't have the due diligence. So this too kind of fits in with, with uh, you know, the Purdue model because you still have the functionalities. The question is who's responsible for the functionality, right? And securing. So if my functionality is software as a service, if it's a web browser, I'm sending analytics up there. Well, that's my business. I, I have to make sure that, you know, you get into serverless, you know, if you get into some cloud serverless applications, you know, that's, that's, that's another security issue that you have to deal with. But I thought this was kind of a, a good way of showing how as we move from on-premise to the cloud, depending on what ser service you take, the responsibility shift. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's, it comes down to the appetite of risk, what your use case is, what your policy is, and what you're trying to achieve. Right. With the yeah, and, and uh, once again, requirements for the process, you know, and uh, um, and that that can move to requirements for the service level agreements associated with these when we're talking about actual control and so forth. So right. So that's kind of that. So if we want to take this cloud idea and into the Purdue, so this is kind of a high level idea that you know, I came up with, uh, with Gabriel as we worked together on, on some of these things on the working groups and kind of brainstorm some stuff. So here you have an example of a Purdue model. You have your system integrated to the left mm -hmm. and you have this thing called a trusted IoT. Then you have your cloud services coming off the IoT DMZ or the enterprise IoT to cloud. What this is trying to illustrate is you know, the trusted IoT, and we'll talk a little bit about trustworthiness later, but <clears throat> The trusted cloud. Now, now, where is this trusted cloud? You'll see there's green air. There's green lines going from supervisory control, IO, and devices. Again, this is a very high-level drawing. This is not detailed, but it's to kind of give the idea that now the Purdue model can now shift geographically, right? <clears throat> that not only is it on-premise, is the conventional model that we've been used to <clears throat> since the 1990s when this first came out, but now the geographic location now shifts to a trusted cloud. What you know? What is happening on this trusted cloud? And this is again where I'm saying the Purdue model is now the geographic location is evolving and the Purdue model principles still apply. That function out those functionalities and securing those functionalities still have to be done today, right? Um, of course, you have your remote support via cloud, you have an IoT access DMZ as well as conventional enterprise IT to cloud. So this really doesn't, in my opinion, you know. Uh, say that the Purdue is out of date. On the contrary, it's like the Purdue is really relevant because we can see here that geographic location doesn't change the functionality, right? It's just where it's working. So I have a follow-up slide with maybe an idea, a little, a little more in-depth idea. So here you have a trusted IoT cloud. Now that cloud can be on-premise. Uh, it can be on-premise, a hybrid model, let's say with Azure Arc, and I think AWS calls it Outpost. And now you see from the different functions, the different protocols. So you could have a, a cloud with virtualized uh, running containers. Uh, there's no reason why a PLC couldn't run as a virtual machine as a container or any other kind of uh, intelligent electrical device. It can be containerized, right? Uh, I know there's some embedded systems that run Docker. You can containerize, I think it was Mokana. Uh, I, think they, I think I read something about how they have the running containers and embedded devices and you know, all it takes is money, RAM, and, and memory, right? I mean, mm -hmm. essentially. But here we have an example where we have, you know, uh, OT, OT protocols, well, Modbus, TCP, BACnet, well, MQTT is a you know, more modern protocol, but they're all gonna go through the security gateway and it's gonna go to this trusted cloud. Now, where that trusted cloud is, it's up to where the asset owner was, as we discussed earlier. But so, now the, have, so the security gateway, is that an appliance? Is that a, um, it could be a... Yeah, it could be a physical appliance. It could even be a virtual appliance, right? It could be running physically on site in front of a rack of 
running a Kubernetes cluster, for example, or it could even be a virtualized machine. So yeah, it's it's in front of that cloud somewhere, sure. Right, but it, so would, would that actually be, if, you know, because people are gonna want to um, place that within this model. Um, are you, uh, uh, would that be like at level three, you know, some of the operations, um, uh, or would that be something that's in the, as you have it labeled here, the 3.5, the IOT um, access DMZ, it, it, it's placed up there for the flow, you know, because people are going to want to know where to uh, place this uh, both in their architecture uh, and whose, res you know, responsibilities on site. I mean, it could be anywhere, but in this case, I put it directly in front of that trusted cloud. Now, uh, it could be it could be Azure Arc, for example, where you have a rack from Microsoft and ah, okay. you have an appliance in there, and it's running mm -hmm. these these virtualized clusters of of, of, uh, of containers. So I kind of left it open to the imagination, right? So there's nothing hard and fast here. It's just <clears throat> again, how do you want to do this? So I just did it because of the previous example showing mm -hmm. the, the three <clears throat> excuse me the three levels going to the, the cloud. So that, this is that, just an example. Yeah, your, your, your example of uh, um, the uh, um, uh, some of the cloud providers provide uh, um, uh, devices that uh, allow for direct connectivity to your cloud infrastructure within that. I think that's what you were referring to associated with the um, Azure appliance. Um, from a network flow standpoint, that would obviously be coming from the control network and going mm -hmm. out. Or do, in your experience, is that kind of, I mean, is that basically th flowing through the DMZ? Um, uh, through that uh, that firewall that's protecting uh, yes. um, the uh, between three and four? It, it can. Sure, okay. it can. I, mm -hmm. It can be anywhere. Yeah, so in this case, you're right. So you have the security gateway because security is both ways, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, the security gateway could be an API gateway, right? Because we're doing, we're looking at API. It could even be an XML gateway, right? Because we know with XML, some bad things can happen. So in this case, yeah, data is feeding back and forth between this trusted cloud, wherever it is. And data is going back out to the IoT access DMZ, which then could go out to the cloud services. It's it's kind of a, an all over the place model. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm narrowing it down just a little bit too much sure. uh, um, for no, this no. example. And so, certainly, any ar architecture is going to be slightly different um, right. depending on the organization, what they select. Uh, there's so many variables we we can't really define it. But uh, I, I think this is a good example of uh, um, an outline uh, for this approach. Right. So it's again very very high level, and um, mm -hmm. and that's why you know you look at different um, uh, services, you know, infrastructure service, software as a service, platform as a service, and that's on the cloud side. But now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, a lot of people are thinking now, it's like, well, you know, uh, why can't you have a, a trusted cloud on premise, which would be a hybrid model, right? I mean, <clears throat> when you look at things like Azure Arc, you're, you're basically bringing a cloud active directory on premise through Azure Arc. So the, the, the flexibility and the power that's out there to me is pretty pretty amazing and impressive. Of course, you know it's like the, the more power, the more responsibility of security, which means more work for us. And uh, we have to use a lot, of, in my opinion, a lot of jurisprudence when we're looking at this because the question is, what am I connecting here? You know, what can I afford to connect? Now, I've seen some models where you have a data diode with traffic exiting one way, and then a data diode somewhere else on the network that comes back from the cloud. So there's this segmentation. Now the question is, hopefully how are it segmented the two shall never join, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhere in the middle. So those are other challenges. I've seen some of those references and they're, they're very interesting references, but to me, it also shows how uh, data diodes, I think are gonna play a bigger and bigger role uh, since they secure at the, at, the, at the layer one of the OSI model. Firewalls, you know, if there's a zero day, they can always get circumnavigated, right? It's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not against firewalls. I, I love firewalls. I, I run them myself at home. It's just uh, we have to really start looking at the different tools we have. Uh, now we're looking at, you know, how do we secure the API? Are we sure these APIs are secure? Are the permissions correct? So the granularity now with all of this power is going to become even more relevant and more complex. Yeah, and and, and I, you know, uh, wh while you're talking through that, you know, that I, I was thinking of the you know, uh, this is all implemented by humans, you know, and the, the people that, uh, you know, we're going to have to, uh, if uh, just a, an engineer implemented this, there's going to be, um, they're going to be introducing a huge amount of risk. So organizations need to plan out um, proper education, yep. bringing in the uh, proper personnel that understand these technologies, understand how to reduce the risk uh, associated with these. Um, you know, it's great since our corporate environment uh, has, 
uh, a lot of experience around this. You know, some people do it better than others, but certainly those people are going to have to be educated uh, about what the process is and what the requirements are. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's going to be a lot of mutual education around that. So absolutely, yeah, people's process and procedures, right? The, yes, sir. That's the the act. We all, we know that you know, ad nauseum. <laughs> still, I still forget though. So. Look a little bit to look a little bit at the six two four four three standard. I want to talk a little bit about this. Is, is showing how uh, this is an international standard. Um, a lot of vendors are, are manufacturing based on these. I know Schneider Electric is following this as part of the security development life cycle. So four one, four two play a key role. But now when we're looking at the edge and all of these things we've been discussing, now we're looking at a system, right? So if I have a virtual, if I have a, um, um, a bunch of Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes clusters or Docker running multiple IEDs. Is that a single device or is that a system? Right. So even though it's virtualized and you have these different containers running these different things, now we're looking, in my opinion, as a system. It's not really a component. So, mm -hmm. um, so the system now becomes even more critical, right? So you have your device, you want to make sure that's secure and that you've done that correctly. Now with everything we've discussed up to now, it's like, you know, this is, these systems can get huge. And, and there's really not going to be a real room, room for error. I know there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and, and a lot of people are putting weight in that. You know, my question is, is, is AI an algorithm or what is it, right? I mean, it's still, it's an infancy in my opinion. Um, but uh, I think as things evolve, AI could be, uh, depending how it's done in architect, could really be very helpful because these things, when you're looking at tens of thousands of devices, this, this can get very, very complicated. And well, going to sit. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's you know I, I think that's going to be a driving factor. The the more people that want to have that data analytics, you know, so that they can uh, see whether or not you know uh, um, AI is uh, useful within this uh, um, within this field, uh, they're not going to want to have those uh, um, computational assets on site. Some organizations can afford it, but most can't, and right. so that that is actually going to push some of the data to the cloud. Um, hopefully it's just, you know, uh, um, uh, for that uh, analytics so that they can do future tracking and stuff like that. Uh, but eventually it's going to get to control. Um, not saying we need to plan for that now, just kind of, you know, uh, putting that out there. But uh, no, no, it, it's I agree. absolutely all of this applies, I think, to everything we've been talking about. I mean, as far as control, I mean, you know, let's not forget we have these things called mobile phones. We have SMS messaging, you know, I mean. It's conceivable. It's like, you know, do you want to do, do you want to do this process? Yes or no. And then the engineer can just hit his phone and say, yes. Now yes. that's a very simple way of doing this because now I have to guarantee the security of the messenger I'm getting, the integrity of the message I'm getting. And is this correct? So that's a whole, you know, mobile apps is a whole other, um, that's a whole other, you know, kettle of fish for lack of a better expression I can think of. That's, that's another uh, potential nightmare, right? Because we've seen so much. Um, Again, you know, looking at policies and procedures, and then there's there's the general term. So, you know, this is a living standard. I'm on two working groups, um, and and the standard is trying to evolve to keep up. I think the the standard has to to be relevant, especially with cloud, IoT, edge, virtualization. I mean, all these technologies, right? We no longer live in that embedded world with SCADA software on premise, right? I mean, there's a lot out there still, uh, but if you were going to look you know, two, three, five years, 10 years down the road, I think the landscape's gonna change. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a huge evolution, a huge change. Well, standards and procedures like this, they're just like laws, you know, they, they, can't, um, uh, they can't keep up with the uh, bleeding edge uh, technologies and uh, um, ideas and uh, um, developments, you know, but they're, they're not designed to do that. They're, they're designed to help us organize what we understand um, and uh, so that we can leverage them uh, in other situations. So even if it's not specifically outlined in this, I think that organizations, teams can uh, leverage standards like this to uh, um, help them uh, think about the process uh, you know, of, uh, of these types of services. I'm, I'm a rather impatient person. So on these working groups, I, I try to, you know, try to move and there's people that are a lot smarter and have a lot more ears on me and just kind of like, okay, you need to calm down. You know, it's coming, right? <laughs> You're the so, driving factor. Be the driver. I, I don't I don't know if I'm a driving factor or a driver pain in the you know what, but you know, it's you know, it's been an experience working on uh, on these committees. It's uh it's been a real education for me because there's some really smart people on there and I've learned a lot being on this stuff, right? Sir. Um so I mentioned trustworthiness or trustworthy, you know, is, 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 do I trust what's on the cloud? 
And I thought this was really interesting. There's these eight pillars of cloud trustworthiness. And uh, we all know about trust, right? We've seen trust on, on a lot of documents, but there's a gentleman by the name of Tony Capel out of Canada. He's on one of the working groups and he started mentioning this trustworthiness. I said, you know, this is really interesting to me. And I, and I think it kind of um, enforces a lot of stuff as security architects is like, you know, we know security is a big thing. You know, the practice of building software to be secure, we, you know, being resilient against attack resistance and fault tolerance, privacy issues. And I think this is a real big thing uh, when you start collecting data uh, of people, you know, let's say you're a, uh, a utility company and you're gonna start having people track their information up on the cloud. How do they access that? Is, is, there, is, there username, is there a username and password? Uh, is there a username, you know, first name, last name at domain.com? Uh, so the whole thing, you know, with uh, data privacy, especially European GDPR, California has something similar. And then, you know, there's 50, there's 50 different states. We'll probably have 50 different nightmares concerning data privacy. So that to me is a big thing on cloud. I think that's the really big thing, in my opinion, that changes from an on-premise to the cloud, because now we're starting getting potential data privacy issues. Uh, do I want to see energy usage on the cloud? If I'm a data center, I don't want to send that to the cloud, right? I don't want them to see that I've put in more stuff that, you know, is using more electricity. I, it, you know, it's, it's, it's some of this stuff that gets complicated. Coherence, your consistency of information regardless of location, right? So we've all heard about software-defined wide area networks, right? That's, that's coming in now. I mean, firewalls like uh, FortiGate and Palo Alto, they're, they're all promoting this, this SD-WAN. Well, if I have you know, five factories going to the cloud, that information has to be consistent, especially if I'm making decisions, right? Mm -hmm. I, so isolation, right? So am I, the trustworthiness of what am I isolating? Am I isolating a function on the cloud that needs to be isolated or versus on the edge versus, you know, it's, it's all over the place in my opinion. You know, crashes, starvation, privacy issues again. Uh, stability, and we know in critical infrastructure, stability is extremely important, quality of service. You know, my inputs and outputs, do those, are they stable? Are they correct? So these, uh, are, these are the eight things that an organization should take into consideration if they are um, planning on uh, um, le leveraging uh, cloud infrastructure yeah. for their processes? Yeah, I, I think, the, as I mentioned earlier, Tony Capel kind of brought this whole trustworthiness idea to the working group. And I started chewing on this more and more. And I said, you know, this really makes a lot of sense because is trust and trustworthiness the same thing? Now, I know I'm splitting hairs with language, right? Mm -hmm. But I think I think trustworthiness really brings more things to the forefront, like we're saying here. So yeah, I mean, if, if you're gonna start putting stuff up on the cloud, I think these pillars are very relevant today. You know, um, you know fairness, you know, legal ethical rights, we all know about that, you know, and valuing sex, race, or similar biases. You know, we, we you know, there's an anonymity, obviously, and, 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 and protection of people's rights and, and, and all these things. The transparency, uh, of awareness, access, uh, auditability, accountability, right? I mean, I'm a big, big fan of uh, audit, especially logging, you know, because mm -hmm. my past career as a firewall admin and, and routing switching after directory logs have saved me in more ways than once. And then to me, the biggest one is the dependability. You know, can I depend on this cloud to be up and provide the trustworthy, trustworthy information that I need for my organization to function? Right. And, and when I look at these, I, I think of some of the arguments that I get ar around, um, you know, uh, uh, the difference between uh, uh, company data, corporate data and data that, you know, from the uh, control network and, and the fact that there's uh, less PII, less uh, um, identifiable information uh, about personnel. Uh, but I, I would argue that we still need to um, take these things into consideration. We, we have to ask uh, how each one of these applies um, as we're making our decisions around risk and uh, um, how we're going to select uh, um, configure services, uh, select some of our uh, controls. Uh, even if we look at it and say, you know, I'll use an example of number six there, fairness, you know, um, that might not apply. But mm -hmm. just because it doesn't apply to us doesn't mean that it won't apply to some other organizations. And you, and you can't just leave it out because 
somebody somewhere might not use it. So I, I, I like, you know, leaving these things in. Um, uh, I like uh, um, uh, leaving uh, all of the um, different areas when you're, uh, when you're having a discussion about how you're approaching things, just mm -hmm. to say that, hey, we, we don't have to worry about this. Uh, but you might have somebody that pipes up and said, well, what about this edge case that, um, uh, you know, we've seen before? And so it's, it, it, these things need to be talked about. Uh, I think uh, even if, you know, in the end, they're like, okay, this does not apply. And that that's actionable data right there. Absolutely. I mean, it's like anything else, right? Um, in the OT world, if you, you have a protocol that doesn't, that doesn't apply, or you got a service that doesn't need to run, then you disable it, right? I mean, you still got to talk about it, right? It's still right. an attack service. But what I find so about the trustworthiness, to me, the attack surface is kind of, I don't know, can I call these pillars to, to stop an attack surface? I guess that can be argued. But at the end of the day, trustworthiness is, can I trust what I'm seeing, what I'm getting and what I'm doing? And can I trust it tomorrow and in five years from now? Right. And, and, to, and you know, when, when we talk about trust, you know, one of the things that comes to my mind uh, that Tim Conway talked to me about um, when I was talking about some of like uh, the attack surface for wireless attacks and uh, mm -hmm. um, the things that uh, the control networks need to understand when they're implementing wireless controls is can you operate that process? Will that process continue to function without that wireless device? And, and it, when we start talking about cloud, when we start talking about the um, uh, computing that is separate from our process, uh, that process needs to be resilient. It needs to be able to operate or at least understand when it's not connected and take the proper action, whether it's to continue, continue operating um, uh, associated with its information or whether it needs to you know, do, take some action such as shut down. Um, sure. you know, it has to shut down properly. So it, uh, and I think all of these, you know, from a trustworthy standpoint, um, helps us understand whether or not our process is resilient to um, those, uh, the communications with the cloud resources. Sure, I mean, so we have to be resilient, whether it's cloud, the industrial internet of things, or on-premise or edge. I mean, it's, it all comes down to me. I, I, I see trustworthiness going past the cloud. It's, it's kind of all over the place, right? I mean, like you said, you know, if I have a problem, do I, do I trust that this will shut down correctly? And if so, will I have the log telling me what happened? Will I have that detail so I know how to deal with this later? But yeah, I, to your point, I, 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 just, I just found these eight pillars really interesting and intriguing. And, and to me, it transcends the cloud. I think it's in everything we do in security, in my opinion, because data privacy is, you know, we may think something is quite benign, but, you, you know, if you've got telemetry data and you're inferring a person's address or apartment, it can get sticky, right? So that's why, like you said, all this has to be talked out, not only you know, not only talked about, but really thought out. And, you know, maybe legal needs to be involved too. Just that way, you know what you're doing and you're careful. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex, but a very intriguing and very interesting world that uh, it's going to keep us busy for a long time, I think. Uh, absolutely. Well, that's all I have. Oh, was that it? Was that it? I didn't know if that was the last slide or. Yeah, that's not. it. I, that's it, Don. Life oh, okay, is on. great, Schneider. great. There's Sorry. our yeah. <laughs> Life is on. Um, you know, Daniel, I uh, um, you know, excellent discussion around this. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, I like how you outlined uh, um, a, a lot of the concepts that I get questions from students and from some of my clients uh, associated with IoT. Um, what are what are your feelings about that connectivity? Uh, I, I think that I've. Uh, um, uh, found a, a person that thinks along the same lines as I do associated with uh, organizations need to take this into consideration. Even if they're like, even if they're like, okay, we're not moving in that direction. Um, they need to have that conversation with their integrators and their service providers uh, to understand how they're applying this in the future. You know, uh, um, whether it's to uh, um, upgrade uh, their current infrastructure or it's for the um, next uh, thing that they're going to deploy for them. You know, it's uh, uh, vendors, integrators are, are turning to the cloud more and more for this managed uh, service providers uh, as well. And, you know, I, I think it's a strength, you know, it just, uh, uh, we've got the technologies out there, as long as we can implement them so that it's resilient within our uh, process, uh, so that we maintain that security, we, we understand the requirements up front, we bring in the people that understand the technologies, I think that's uh, the most important thing to moving towards uh, the cloud within the control network. I agree. I, I had somebody at once ask me, like, who's responsible for the edge? 
and I kind of said everybody. Right? <laughs> Everyone in your organization is responsible. Same as the cloud, everyone's responsible. So it's, uh, like I said earlier, you know, you, we could be looking at thousands and tens of thousands of devices, you know, going, communicating everywhere. And it's really going to come down to really documenting your architectures now, right? I mean, you really have to know what is it that you have. It's not like I'm crawling on the floor and I find this category 6A cable going to a switch, but it's not going anywhere else. Um, it, it, it means we really have to be really detail oriented, in my opinion, that the def, you know, that the drawings and, and everything are really clear and kept up to date. Because as humans, it's real easy to say, well, yeah, I'll get it tomorrow, I'll get it tomorrow. But you know, tomorrow can turn into a year or two. Next thing you know, you could have devices you forgot about. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges in, in this whole industrial era of things when you have you know, a plethora of devices, you know, is what you're seeing correct? It comes back to trustworthiness, in my opinion. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, th thank you for this, uh, this talk, Don. I, Absolutely. I really enjoyed this. Was, I, I really appreciate enjoyable. that. Where, where can people find you if they want more information? Uh, um, should they you know, look to the Schneier site or uh, are there other locations? Oh, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. So they want to look for me on LinkedIn. There's a- uh, I'll, I'll include that in the show notes. So, so I'm on LinkedIn. Um, okay. That's probably the best way is to get me Roger. through LinkedIn. Right. Well, Daniel, I re really appreciate it. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you, Don. Much appreciated. Thank you for tuning in to another concept overview with the SANS ICS and Cutaway Security teams. Please let us know if there are other topics you would like us to cover in the comments below. If you enjoyed the content, please be sure to like and subscribe to the SANS ICS YouTube channel. This has been Don C. Weber of Cutaway Security. Go forth and do good things.